this is the Conquer Worry Podcast, and my name is Jay Coulter. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and advocate for those who struggle with stress or their mental health. This is your podcast home for inspirational stories and interviews with people who are making a difference in the lives of others. This episode is sponsored by Jay's new book, predictably called Conquer Worry, How to Build a Simple Daily System to Reduce Stress. Visit ConquerWorry.com or jcoulter.com for more details. Thanks for downloading this episode of the Conquer Worry Podcast. We have a fantastic story for you today. Our guest story has been featured on Dr. Drew, Larry King Live, and Good Morning America. Joining me today is Tanya Brown. She is a celebrity author, a voice against domestic violence, and a motivational speaker, as well as the sister of the late murdered Nicole Brown Simpson. Tanya, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and telling your story. Uh, You're very welcome. I'm excited to share the story of hope with many people who may be missing that in their life. I love it. We, We love having those types of guests on the show, but let's get right to a question that is going to be at the top of most people's minds that have downloaded this podcast. Tanya, who killed your sister, Nicole Brown Simpson? In my opinion, uh, my ex-brother-in-law, O.J. Simpson. And how do you feel when I'm, people present a different opinion? You know, I, everybody, we live in America, and even if we didn't, everybody has their own opinion, and everybody's entitled to that. And now with my professional experience, as well as my educational experience on the dynamics of domestic violence, uh, you know, he, he matches all the criteria that... Um, ultimately led to my sister's, my sister's demise as well as, as Ron's. He is uh, the perfect example of an abuser. So, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't judge. I just respect because it's true. Everybody has their own opinion and everybody's entitled to that. I just, I have my own. Yep, that's perfectly fair. Now, t- tell yeah. us about the kids. How are Nicole's children doing today? I know, you know what, it all, I always laugh because they're not kids anymore. Um, you know, Sydney, I think is 31, Justin's 28, I believe. And they're doing great. They're solid kids. They're professional. Here I go using the word kids again. They're professionals. They are healthy. They are happy. And my mom's in constant contact with them. They're very much part of our life and our family. Excellent. It's great to hear that they turned yeah. out right because those are obviously some huge life obstacles that they had to overcome. Absolutely. You know, if anybody has any reason to be self-destructive or to fail in this world, it probably would be them. I mean, they don't have a mom nor a dad. And, you know, they they were raised by us as well as his side of the family. And they've really turned into rock-solid adults. And I'm very proud of who and what they have become. It's amazing. Excellent. Well, hey, let's shift gears here. All right, so People Magazine reported that in 2004, you checked into a mental health facility for 10 days. Yet today, you're a thriving entrepreneur, author, speaker, and I found a quote from you that said, people Mm -hmm. have written to me saying that my story gave them hope and helped them get out of their depression. You also said that if you can be hope or inspiration for anybody, you're going to do it. And I got to tell you, Tanya, that's the type of story that we like to tell on the Conquer Worry podcast. So let's start with the beginning. Take us back to 2004. Uh, What was going on? Wow. You know, it's a it's a very busy story. It was a very chaotic story. I, um, you know, when we don't face our grief, our stressors, our depression, our anxiety, whatever it is that you're going through, because pain, anxiety, everything's very immeasurable. What may, be, what may bring me anxiety may not bring you anxiety. So it's very immeasurable. <clears throat> but what I ended up doing, I had to bury six friends of mine in high school and two right out of high school. And then I lost my best friend in 2000. And then the murder of my sister and the trigger was the cancellation of my wedding four days before. And that trigger was a godsend for me because I went into 
full on self-destructive mode. I was popping Klonopin. I was drinking red wine because I loved my red wine. And I just, I was horribly angry, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, pretty much all throughout my young adult life were very familiar to me, but the hate that I had towards everyone and towards the world, that was scary. You know, I was born and raised, I basically have like a happy gene. I always default to happy. I may go through my really dark, you know, depressive, depressive moments and experience a massive anxiety. But for the most part, I have that happy gene. And, but somehow I couldn't tap into that during, during this episode, during this chapter of my life. And when my wedding was canceled, when my wedding was canceled, he didn't even cancel it. I heard it from the facility. So four days before every, we had everything other than my mom's eyelashes and her shoes. We had everything. And, but it is exactly what I needed to explode. And every piece of stress, anxiety, jealousy, envy, hate, anger, things that were very, very scary to me. And just in a moment of a hot second exploded, I bet my lid flip, it flipped off and uh, we had a family friend of ours over and he would drive anybody crazy to tell you the truth. I always ask Denise for a heads up. When is he coming into town? Cause I need to meditate. I kind of need to get into that right frame of mind. And the reason why I share that is because everybody has that person that zaps their energy or zaps their joy. And this person does that because it, 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 he's not a bad person. It's just the energy level affects my energy level. And that, I think, is a very, very important, quite, uh, important point because we engage in circumstances and situations with people that drive us crazy. And I really want to share with your listeners that, you know, you have the choice to say you're not good for my mental health, you're not good for my emotional health or my physical health. And he said something to me that day, that afternoon, and I flipped. I almost hit my dad. I blamed my mom and my dad for Nicole's murder. I called Denise horrific names. We didn't talk for an entire year. And we lived together and underneath the same roof. So that was, that was a whole other dynamic. And um, I went to my room. And on my way there, Denise grabbed my shoulders. And she said, you need coping skills because I was out of control to the point where, and we'll talk about my book, but the first chapter of my book is called, And the Oscar Goes To, because it was highly, highly dramatic. And um, Hang on, Tanya, verbally, let, let, let me stop oh, go ahead. for a second before you get to the part about being in your room, because I know you told me about uh -huh. this in our pre-call. So the incident, the trigger, to use your language, that really caused mm -hmm. you to flip was actually a culmination of what had been happening for a long period of time. You, you lost some friends in high school. You lost some folks mm -hmm. afterwards. Obviously, the horrific murder of your sister. Why do you think that was the incident that made you flip? Because I had a ton of unresolved grief, unresolved pain, unresolved stress, and unresolved anxiety. I never faced my stuff as I was going through it. And I want to encourage people to walk through that tornado of chaos because once you do, it doesn't mean that life isn't going to throw you curveballs, And it doesn't mean that life is going to be totally easy, but you'll be able to navigate through your life challenges and life chaos on a daily basis with more ease because you'll, you'll be more calm. You have coping skills. Now you're tapping into what works for your overall well-being. I just, you know, that is, that is the operative word here, unresolved. Well, let's, Don't let's live life that. with unresolved pain, yeah. So specifically, uh, in high school or after high school, before your sister's murder, did you get any type of counseling or therapy for some of those issues? None. You know why? Because I thought I didn't have any problems. You know, I, I had... I have World War II parents, and I don't know if your listeners have World War II parents, but they have a whole different set of coping skills. And so I was raised with, these are the cards you're dealt with. We just need to travel through that. You know, we need to play those cards out. And it doesn't mean that my parents, they never told me not to feel. It's just that's how they coped with their challenges. That's right. And so I just, 
I just kept on being that happy person. You know, I was that, I was that girl. If there were five parties on a Friday night in high school, I was at all 10 and it, I wasn't boozing or anything like that. It's just, I loved being around people and these people I grew up with that, you, you know, all throughout my childhood. So I always had that happy face and looking back now in hindsight, I put so much unnecessary pressure on myself having to be happy all the time. And I want to encourage people that it's okay to have a bad day. Sure. I was actually judged many times. Tanya, why are you having a bad day? It's like, I'm not allowed to, Sure. you know? So I, I put a lot of pressure on myself trying to, I guess, people please and just be happy for everyone. And that all caught up with me. I really wasn't being authentic. So you didn't get professional help, uh, in high school, after high school, how about after Mm-mm. your sister was murdered? Did you seek any type of counseling at that point? You know, I did. We were part of the victim witness program um, that the court, um, they basically gave you that resource. So at that time, I had never gone to therapy. And so I went to a local therapist and he was more interested in the kids and the case than he was more about my mental health and well-being. And I only went a few times and then I was done. If and you could, and you know what's sad about oh go ahead no if you could go back in time and talk to yourself what would you tell yourself to do with regards to getting help at that stage wow that's a good question I've never been asked that but I I really say I would I would probably say no I would say be authentic be authentic it's okay to not be okay and knock on the door and ask for help. You know, we're talking almost 23 years later. I didn't know what therapy really was. I thought it was for really sick people. And today it's like, oh, I'm going to go talk to my therapist because I'm going through a hard time. But 23 years ago, it wasn't really talked about. That's right. And so I would really encourage myself to say, okay, Tanya, you need to go talk to someone. I love it. And, you know, we it, because of the reach we have with the Conquer Way platform, people reach out to me pretty regularly. And, you know, I'm not qualified to give any type of advice, but I'd say the first mm-hmm. thing you have to do before you do anything else, before you listen to podcasts or read books, go get professional help. That is the quickest path. to Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I work, I work in the world of addiction and recovery and treatment. I'm not in recovery, but I'm so passionate about it because I was popping Klonopin and thank goodness I wasn't addicted to it, but I understand why people use and why people drink themselves to oblivion because they don't want to feel. And so I, you know, it's just about facing that hardship, facing that time and walking through that tornado of chaos. But I firmly believe I would be part of that community if I wasn't given the chance to work through my challenges in the psych unit. And like you had said a few, a few moments ago, I was in the psych unit for 10 days. I slipped out and that's okay. I attempted a suicide. I, had the bottle of Klonopin in my hand. I had my bottle of red wine in my right hand. And as I was putting the pills to my mouth, my sister Dominique said, what the heck are you doing? And I, <laughs> this is how I know I'm here for a greater purpose, to give people that hope, because I really shouldn't be here. Or if I did survive that by taking a bottle of Klonopin, who knows what I would be like. But I said to my sister, I go, Dominique, get me the heck, get me the heck out of here before I hurt myself or someone around me. And immediately she took me to, she took me to my girlfriend's home. Excellent. So, and this is really where I think the story gets interesting because the recovery is really what a lot of our listeners like to hear about and the redemption, mm-hmm. and the mental resilience that you've been able to build. So walk our listeners through that. How did you recover? How did you rebuild your mental resilience? I did not do it alone. And I went to a place where it was safe. And, you know, we have such a huge stigma of, you know, behavioral health centers, psych units, therapy. There's such a huge stigma. And you know what? I always say, do what you need to do to stay on this side of the grass. And, but I have a team of people in the hospital that worked with me every single day, but I was willing. And I think that's what makes people really heal. You've got to throw up your hands and accept and surrender to the situation that you're in and really beg for help and ask for that help. And I did that. And not only did I do that with the professionals in the hospital, I did it to my higher power. I said, God, I am mad that I need to be here 
I'm mad. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to be here, but I know I need to be here. So give me a sign. And moments after I had like sat on the edge of my bed, I'm looking at this amazing view of the Pacific ocean in Laguna beach. And immediately my world and my heart opened immediately. I was just like, my gosh, I finally see, I see, and I hear the answer as to why I need to be here. And right when I did that, my healing began. But until we accept and surrender to the situation that we are in, we will not heal. Or if we do heal, it will, it will be a, a slower process for sure. But I did not do it alone. And I want to encourage people, you know, it's not fun. It's, it's hard. It's dark. It's scary. But my God, you don't need to do it alone. I most certainly did not. And my heart breaks for people when they try to white knuckle their way through really hard times. I'm getting choked up because there's no reason that you have to do life on your own when you are battling with, you know, feelings and emotions that are very, very scary. So I, um, I did the work. I did not throw this stuff under my bed and hoping it would seep in through osmosis. I showed up in every group uh, class that the hospital had, and I didn't go to the cafeteria and chat it up with the, with the fellow patients. I went to my room. I went back to my room and I journaled and I processed and I released the pain. And it got to the point where, you know, I threw my teddy bear. I threw my pencils. I almost hit a wall. I, I mean, I let it out. And I want people to understand that emotions are very real and they will consume your life. And I always say, get yourself in a safe place and release it. And I'm really, really, uh, I say that with, I say that emphatically because life is way too short to hold on to that. And it will kill you. Eventually it will kill you. If not physically, it'll kill you. It'll zap you of joy, your happiness, you're moving forward. And all of those things are really, really essential in enjoying your life, but you don't need to do it alone. You see, Jay, it's, um, people always think that, okay, if I call, I'm going to be judged. I'm, you know, it's going to be on my record. And my answer to that is who cares? This is your life. This is your welfare. This is your well-being. And you don't need to tell anyone. You don't need to tell anyone what you're doing or where you're going. It is, I just always encourage anybody that's going through anything, talk to somebody. Don't hold that in because it will build into anger and it will build into resentment. And really, you won't want to be around anybody and nobody's going to be a one and nobody will want to be around you. And that's no way to live this beautiful life that we have. Well said, Tanya. So look, for time reasons, let's move on a little bit past the actual depths of the recovery process. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit about, I think your term is self-care strategies. We use the term protocol system. Just a daily uh -huh. routine, daily things that you do to help maintain your mental resilience and try to help ensure you don't end up back in that place. And you and I talked in the pre-call about mindfulness and meditation being two of the things that you really focus on. And you teach your clients how to do. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on mindfulness. Oh, you know, mindfulness is a new term. It's been around for years, for thousands of years. And I'm not, I'm not really, I'm not trained in it, but I know what I know just from my own practice and, and what I've read. I'm not a teacher in it, but I know that when we can just slow down in everything we do, everything from driving instead of rushing to point A to point B, I do not, when I'm driving in my car, I don't have my stereo on or my radio. I, I have silence. I'm breathing my way through my, through my journey to my destination. I'm doing deep breathing breath work, which helps lower the anxiety. I am completely present with, with the now, and, but it doesn't come overnight. I mean, this is really a skill that people need to learn to be more. They need to learn how to be consistent with it, how to practice it, because you know, we live in the, we live in an era where people have busy brains. We're busy. We want things done fast and we want them done now. But the science shows that when you can slow down and be fully present in what you are doing, whether that's doing a project at work, whether it's doing the dishes, whether it's cleaning windows, feel the temperature of the water, feel the soap suds. What are you experiencing? 
and try to tune out every other thought that is coming into your mind. And the way you, the way that I do that is that I picture the meditation is so hard for people and being fully present in mindfulness is so challenging for people. But anytime that I get an interruption when I'm breathing and doing my, my meditation on my pillow or on my mat, I always think of my thought or I visualize my thought in a cloud. And as it's traveling across my face, I'll get it to like the middle of my forehead, which in meditation is called the third eye. So once it gets there, I always go, you know what? Thought, I see you and I hear you, but right now is my time. And then I, and then I visualize the cloud um, passing by me. But this is the thing. What we resist will persist. So if you're trying to meditate and you're saying no to your thoughts, I'm not going to deal with you right now. Guess what? The more of those thoughts are going to be knocking at your door. But mindfulness teaches you how to acknowledge those thoughts, but then coming back to your breath work and paying attention to your present moment. But do not, do not resist those thoughts. Just pay attention to it and talk to it and say, I'll get to you later. And that's what works for me. But to keep my anxiety down and for me to manage my everyday life, I breathe. I breathe my way through my life. Because without breath work, science also shows that breathing, doing really good, deep breathing, reduces anxiety significantly. You know, Jay, I, I always tell, I tell myself and I tell people all the time that if I'm going to be sharing my tools and my story, I'm going sh- to be 100% vulnerable. I am on medication. I share that with people. I'm proud of it. I need it. And I'm okay with that. But pills do not help you manage everyday life. We cannot rely solely on medication. We need daily practices to help calm the mind, help calm the soul. And with that, overall, you'll have more productivity at work. You'll be more proficient and efficient. And you'll actually build healthier relationships, not only with yourself, but with everybody that you, that you care about. So I really encourage people. I mean, I could go on and talk about mindfulness and meditation, but I really want people, you know, I want to encourage your listeners, look into that and, you know, get on YouTube. YouTube is our library. There's phenomenal resources on YouTube and I'm constantly learning new skills and new um, modalities, and I just encourage people to do that. Well, Tanya, you're talking my language. In the book I wrote, Conquer Worry, uh, it's, it walks you through the process of building a customized protocol system where you take the ideas that work for you. We don't dictate what mm-hmm. tools you want to use. Right. And those include a breathing system. There's mindfulness in mm-hmm. there. There's meditation. And I, right. you nailed it when you said it's just a matter of coming up with you, what you are going to find effective and then doing it every single day. So tell me, every how day, you keep yourself, how do you keep yourself on track to do it every day? It's just, it becomes your habit. It becomes part of your life. You know, in the beginning, I, it, right after my discharge, because I didn't know any of this stuff before I was hospitalized. So I had to be in a dark place for me to really learn about it and be self-aware with it. So when I was discharged from the hospital, I was on a great track for at least two years, three years. I was like, okay, this is part of my practice. But then, you know, life happens and you fall off track, but at least you're, you, have that, you have that tool in your toolbox. So I know now whenever I do fall off that meditation track or just the track of life, I have the tools now, I'm equipped. So then I could just get back on it and I'm very disciplined with it. So you've got your, I, you know, we have the technology of a cell phone and we have our calendars on our cell phone, but I actually have a paper weekly outlook um, calendar because there's something about psychology, putting a pen to paper. It just, you retain more, you're more disciplined instead of just plugging it into your phone. So it's part of my daily, it, it's part of my daily calendar. And it's just, when you do it consistently, you can do it all throughout the day. You do it when you first wake up. You just, you become more self-aware where, okay, you know what? I'm my anxiety, my worries kind of creeping in right now. You just kind of sit back and you tap into that arsenal. You tap into that tool and you sit back and you breathe. So it just becomes your, it becomes a default when you do it on a consistent basis. And it doesn't take 
an hour. It takes five to 10 minutes, whatever will work for you. And I always encourage like the people, your listeners, if they work, if they're full-time employees or maybe they're employers, Go to the bathroom and take a break. <laughs> Nobody's going to bother you in there, you know, and do some deep breathing. I used, to, I used to go to my car during my lunch hour, and I used to pop in a meditation CD. I'd eat my lunch and just go in my car in a safe place. I mean, this was years ago, so, I mean, we live in a different world today. But just get in a safe place and put on your iPod and just listen to some meditation, whether it's guided or whether it's just you're sitting in silence doing breath work. And it's not hokey pokey. This is actually, you know, Western and, and Eastern philosophies are slowly merging, but at least we're seeing the benefit of it. And, um, and I just encourage people really just start doing it. And if you feel irritated and you, if you feel frustrated, work through that. Because once you get a handle on it, oh my gosh, it's, um, I have a lot of energy. If I didn't do breathing exercises and meditation every day, I think I'd, end up where I ended up in 2004, to tell you the truth. It I, really is a lifesaver. I, I definitely understand. And I tell you, I, um, I, that's exactly what I do and what I encourage folks to do when it comes to scheduling it. So in my mm-hmm. Google Calendar, it's a, my, it's the six things I do every day, my six protocols are a reoccurring task. So I know at the end of the day, if I've had a bad day, I probably have not done all six protocols or, and checked them off to move to the next day. So exactly, I love that idea. Hey, we're running a little short on time here. I want to talk mm-hmm. about your book. Your book's called Finding Peace Amid the Chaos, My Escape from Depression and Suicide. Tell our listeners a little bit about the book and where they could pick up a copy. The book is all about my life. I really walk people through my childhood. I walk through the trials. I share the back end of the story that people I have always been curious about, about the trials, everything from me going into Nicole's house the next day, seeing the Ben and Jerry's ice cream that she went to pick up with her son and the kids. Um, you know, I really, I walk people through it, but you know, that part, that part of the chapter, that part of the book is very, very small, but it was significant enough for me to put in because it really impacted my life, of course, as you can only imagine. And then I walk people through the losses and the chaos and, you know, how I, how I traveled through that and more so how it affected me and the way I start out each chapter and all the chapters are very small. They're only like three pages, but I start each chapter out with a journal entry from when I was in the hospital or or shortly after my discharge. But I'm very candid and open. And when I was writing the book, I said to William, because he was my co-writer, William Croyle, I said, William, I, you know, there's something missing. This is another sad story that's going to be sitting on somebody's shelf. I said, people are thirsty for solutions. I'm having a bad moment. What do I need to do? And he said, okay, Tanya, he goes, come up with five to seven tools that you used when you were in the hospital that helped you stay on track. And I came up with 12, (laughs) but I couldn't call it Tanya's 12 step program. I just, you know, cause that's already taken the 12 step program, (laughs) right? But they're tools, they're tools, everything from scheduling it, you know, like what you were saying, how you do that. Uh, Give yourself some praise. Life's hard. If you got out of bed and you're depressed, believe me, I know how hard that is. So give yourself a huge hug over the fact that you got out of bed. That's a huge accomplishment. Uh, Accept and surrender. I talk about that. I talk about forgiveness. I talk about problem solving and goal setting. Uh, How to keep how to keep your stress levels low so your life is more organized. Not to the point where it's going to freak the type A and the type B people out, but to the point where if you tap into one, two, five, or all 12, you know, all throughout the day or throughout your week, your life will be more manageable. Absolutely. But people, people are thirsty for solutions today. So where could folks pick up a copy of your book and find these solutions? Thank you. I want people to go to my website at tanyabrown.net. It's T-A-N-Y-A dot net, tanyabrown.net. And the reason why I want people to go to the website so I can personally sign it with a huge hug because people don't receive enough human connection anymore. We don't receive, everybody's connected to cell phones. We're not connected to one another. So I always sign my book, Huge Hugs and Love, Tanya Brown. And if, if people would like that for either themselves or for a friend, we've got Christmas coming up. You can go to my website and 
I'd be more than happy to sign a book for you. Excellent. I'll have that link in the show notes to this podcast. Tanya, thank you so awesome. much for coming on the show. And um, hopefully you'll come back on again sometime. Absolutely. Absolutely. I really appreciate the opportunity and happy holidays, everyone. And if you need to reach out to me, you can email me through my website. I'm always here. This episode is sponsored by Conquerwory.org. Please visit conquerwory.org and join our growing community.